along Clapton Pond there, along onto the narrow way. We're talking about roughly about one in the morning, half till one in the morning. Down Mare Street, I went across Commercial Road and headed for the Rob Wife Tunnel. And I go through the tunnel now. Ironically enough, coming the other way was a police car. Of course, he couldn't turn around, so I put my foot down and go out the other side of the tunnel and come round a roundabout, like there's a roundabout there then, with a church to the right. And I parked the car in there. I lost my brother-in-law, I pulled away. I parked outside of a church. I walked back, I had the keys on me. I walked back and my brother and Ron picked me up by the entrance to the tunnel. And then we drove back, we dropped Ronnie Bender down at Hackney Road. And we go back to my father's place in Queen's Road. No, I don't think we'd realise in a, in a way what, what, what had happened. You know, you're doing this in, in, in a state of shock in a way. And unfortunately, I dropped it somewhere where it shouldn't have gone, which was to put Freddie Foreman in the, in the frame. I never knew, I just wanted to get rid of it. I didn't want a body on my hands. As long as it was away from me, I was, happy, I was quite content with that. And unfortunately, it was left somewhere. And when Ronnie Christ said, oh, yeah, where'd you put it? Well, hell broke loose. It's on Freddie Foreman's plot. There's a man in bed with his wife. He doesn't even know what's going on. And wakes up in the morning, or, or it's allegedly a body's taken over there. Come on, that ain't on. That's not on with me. So, perhaps it would have been better off being found. Looking back on it now, perhaps it would, Fred couldn't answer it. It was, it was nothing to do with him. It was nothing to do with him. It was just the car was on that petrol. It was an old Zodiac, two to, uh, the old two tone, Mark II. One light wasn't working, and now I am driving a body along at one o'clock in the morning with two people minding me. And you talk about violence. How did I got stopped that night? Whoever stopped me was coming with him. That's how it had to be. I'm sorry I'm being blatant about it. I'm not proud to say that. But it was, I, was on, I was on the line here now. I'm in the thick of it, whether I like it or not. We're all implicated. Which was to lay on a grieve me. I remember standing here. Standing here, and I threw the keys in there. And to my knowledge, they're still there to this day. That was the only link to me and that of the events of that night. That was the only link. But this is what I threw. Running around here as a kid, with all, I mean, it was different then. And yet, one of the biggest tragedies was having a few hundred yards from where I was brought up. So really, when you think of it, and I've never really put that together. Ironic, ironic, you know. I'm going to map this for prosperity. You know, people don't know about these things here, but that's what it was all about. And you still hear that little bit today. So, part and parcel of life. Our arrest. This is where we was. And we left here about, about 10 for a quarter to 11. Hard the cars. I went to the Astor Club in the West End. And there he has the more no rest of us. But this is where that is under observation. And actually, the last photograph of the craze in freedom was taken in that park. I think in the beginning they would have been happy with the craze. And when they got the lot of us, it was a bonus. It was a bonus. To be honest with it all, they nicked me, they pulled me in twice. So first of all, they got it wrong. They put it to me that I'd, uh, I was asked to do someone a favour. I drove a car away, didn't know what was in it. In other words, it was a hint, look, it wasn't your thing. You want to go against them, here's your chance. But I didn't bite on that, I weren't having that. They released me. They pulled me in again. Me and my young brother, Nicky, they pulled Chris in, took us down to Tin Tazel House, questioned us, and he said, look, he said, the next time we come, there's no going home, no going home. And they'd done a raid one morning, they nicked a lot of us. He took me to Tin Tazel House, when I get to Tin Tazel House, there's Cater, Frank Cater, Nipper Reed, and John DeRose there. 
and Mooney, Henry Mooney, this is the investigation. And he says to me, I'm going to ask you five questions. There's your opportunity to tell me what you know. And he asked me five questions. Where was I on such and such a night? When was the last time I saw Jet the Hat or Jet Medvedev alive? Was I asked to, to take him somewhere? Was I asked to drive a car somewhere? And a couple of others were And I went, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, right, you'll be taken away, you're going to be charged with murder. I always remember that day because they found us guilty on the Tuesday evening. And he, it was Melvin Stevens and the judge, which I'll say no more about, I'd like to say something, but it's best I don't. Um, they brought us back for sentence the next morning. I always remember they was letting us go out two at a time to the toilet. And me and Ronnie Cray went to the toilet. And all I remember was a principal officer with two screws coming up and saying to him, Ronnie, you want it upstairs? That's exactly what they said. And when he turned to me, and he was smoking a cigarette, he stood on the floor, stamped on it, and here we go, telling him the first man to get a 40-year recommendation. And he marched up the stairs. And he went up, and about 10 minutes later, he came down, and we was all waiting. We was all in one cell. They put us all together. And he came back in the cell, and he lit a fag up. He never said a word. And I think it was Charlie who said to him, oh, what did you get? He went, only a 30. I said, no, nothing had happened. I was amazed. I was amazed. It, 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 Ian Barry, I can clearly see Ian Barry, who walked in the beggars with Ronnie, and they said he put the bullets in the ceiling. He went like that. He stood in the ceiling, he said, went bang, and it hit the back of the fence like, only a 30. He said, oh, nothing happened. Then the next one up was Ian Barry, 20 minimum. Then they brought Reggie up, 30 minimum. Uh, then my brother went up, and as Chris went up, he got a life in a 15 minimum. He come down, he already said to me, you're next, only 20 minimum for you, and I thought I was going to get. But they kept it in line. And then the last one was Roddy Bender. He got a 20 wreck. Um, then they took Charlie up. I tried to laugh him and Fred off. It was like the judge turned into a frenzy. It's like he lost all control. He was getting a kick out of it. Because I have never seen so much blindness in this trial in all my life. I've never seen nothing like it. I'm a fighter. I'm a fighter. And I didn't, I just feel a bit of injustice somewhere here. I didn't get a fair trial. They wanted them out of the way. By hook or by crook. And it was says to me, but if we go by a crook, you're going. I remember getting off the coach in Wandsworth Prison that night. And you know what? In the, it never really bothered me. I had things on my side, and I'll tell you how I viewed it. I was the youngest. That was a bonus to me in my eyes. There was other men at that time, just getting the train robbers, getting big sentences like, like we got. So that took a little bit of the sting out of it. Uh, my brother's round the corner. Uh, and I don't think he sunk in for about two years. I don't think he really sank in. I really mean that. He just didn't, I've never moaned about it, never complained about it. All them years, I've never, he just, uh, uh, it's just a non-existent. It, does, it, it just doesn't. It, 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 it's just something you get you get into. You get to live that way of life. After about four or five years, it don't mean nothing no more. It's survival, and you start to survive it. But prison does a funny thing to you. It stains your soul. You never recover from it. Not then. Then you can you can come out of it. But once you're going to over the 12 year mark, it affects your life, even to this day. Uh, you look around where I live, nothing to remember prison by, but I live a prisoner every day. It's what, it's what, it, it, it's what it makes you. you. You can't escape it. I still have prison habits, I know that. 
It's the way you're, you, you, you carry yourself when you come out of it. But if it, did it do any good? I think, you re, I think you rehabilitate yourself if it's such a world. You certainly don't get it in prisons. You do yourself time. The whole idea is to keep you time. And as you get older, you slow down a bit. But you can do what you like in them places, but they'll do you a time. You ain't getting out of there. And oh, I came through it very hard. Nearly didn't. I came out. Things didn't work out with marriage. It was over. I didn't know that. I came out to a life license. Um, I came out to this reputation of the underworld and all the rest of it. He stood law to what it was all about. Um, and I think, in a funny way, people admired it. I don't think it was an admiration for the craze. I think it was admiration for what I did. I'm going to be honest about it now. Because people would say to me, I haven't have done what you did. And I found that a bit freaky, mate. Because I did. But many people say, I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have done that. Did it? Look where you give up. But I don't think that bothered me in that way. I, it, it, it was just something that... Uh, you lived your life that way and that was it. You accepted it as part of the game. But it was... Um, it was to affect me. I lost my father. He died while I was in prison. You know, even for our prison lives, it was never easy because of who we all were. He wants to be like a fucking animal and even left it, have to live with me. And that's what makes a lot of the boys different. They live by them rules in there as well. It didn't change when we went to prison. It didn't change me. I still did the things I did. Because you, you have to survive it. A lot of people can't survive it. Uh, so I did exactly the same in there. It's what I did outside. Only you were in a different environment. Um, when you're living in them places, you don't know what you're dealing with. You know, I have some very good friends in prisons, but I wouldn't like them living next door to me. That's putting it nicely. But, I mean, I can remember looking down the landing and the lowest sentence was 25 years. You know, it's, there's always someone worse off than you. Um, but I think the, the after a while, you, it, it, you settle into a way, it's you and them. You know, they give a bit, and they take a bit, and we take a bit, and try to get a bit more, and it's a game all the way through it. And the game plays itself out. You know, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it, it's about mind games. But prison, prison's like that. Prison is a mind game. And, uh, but, yeah, the inmates. It's, it's who you are in there. People don't respect, I mean, sex offenders and that, bottom of the rung. You don't even get to get, you don't get near them, they're protected and all the rest of it. And I, I must admit, I've had some of the worst of the worst around me, unfortunately. Uh, from Brady to, to Strathon, you name them, you know. And you become immune to a lot of, a lot of pain that, that people would be shocked at at you. I've seen men top themselves, cut themselves to bits, crack up, you know. So you all live in, and it, you become very immune to it. I know I am. You know, nothing shocks me no more. You see tragedy around you all the time, but it, by the same hand, there's a lot of humour in them places. Some of the best comedians I've ever seen should be on the Palladium. I often question, often answer the question, what the hell are they doing in the nick? You get some very, painters, carpenters, comedians, sick, you name it. But, but they're in prison, you know. Um, so you've got the humorous side of it and the very downside of it. But in the end of the day, when you, when you go behind that door, that's when it finds you out, you know. It's all about being a brave face, never showing emotion to, the, to, to, to other men. It's a weakness, you know, it's, it's rules that you live by. Um, you know, a man comes out jolly every day of the week. A lot of backstabbing goes on in them places, like, you know, you can, you can have a high rank woman and be down the floor the next. Someone's always waiting to pull you down. It was all the worst moments, all the bad moments, a lot of it. 
but I made a humorous life out of it somewhere. I don't know how. I remember getting, I spent, I got 12 months down a control unit uh, for gross, pol gross personal violence to a prison or assaults and all the rest of it. And you don't get, you get to go in front of what they call a board of visitors, the visiting magistrates. A governor is only entitled to take so much, give you so much punishment. If the charge is deemed to be of, of such a serious nature, they give it to a board of visitors where they can take big lumps of remission or give you a lengthy spell down the block. And we were going in there and getting 12 months punishment, and I mean punishment, no bed, nothing. But how long can you keep a regime like that? Do you know I started to thrive on it? I started to enjoy it? Fact, I ain't lying, I've done it. I don't know how, but I learned to sleep 23 hours a day. It's, it's amazing, it's amazing, the sense of survival. And you make a little life for yourself. I never come out of that control unit for 12 months. In the unit, seeing one other con who was down there with me, never see no one. When they opened your door, you had 10 screws outside the door, ready to jump on you, you know. But how long can they keep that up? It has to break down, you know. As I said to you earlier on, we've all got to live together. And I remember going to that control unit Christmas Eve, 1972, when I've just been in front of the Board of Visitors and got some of the biggest punishment ever dished out of prison. And I remember saying to him, yes, your rules now, but you'll live by mine. You're going to have to live with me here. Yeah? You can't do no more to me. And they tried to slip a psychiatrist into me. They tried the chaplain, you know, and it starts to loosen itself. And I come out of that. I came out of it. I don't know how, but I did. You know, and, um, but punishment, it's like a kangaroo court. You've got no chance you kill me before you go in there. Let's be fair about it. But you don't remember the bad side of it. If you ask me what I was doing in 1978 or 73, I couldn't tell you. I don't.